All right, so we're wrapping up chapter 11. Put the captions on. Okay. So we're in chapter 11 on linear regression and 11.2 is on scatter plots. And as it says here in science, a scatter plot is widely used to present measurements of two or even more variables. It's particularly useful when the values of the variables of the y-axis are thought to be dependent on those of the x-axis. So just what we're you know, used to with linear functions, for example, where y depends on x. Okay, so in a scatter plot, however, the data points are plotted as individual points. They're not connected or joined. So we're going to take a look here. We're in the chapter 11 homework. And we left off at 12 last time. So 13 is constructing a scatter plot. And these are straightforward. They give you a table showing the number of hours worked and the amount of money spent on entertainment by each of six students. And then you're asked to create a scatter plot. And so notice the axes, you have the number of hours worked along the x-axis and the amount spent on entertainment in dollars along the y-axis. So you could think of each one of these rows presenting an ordered pair which on the graph is going to be a point. So for four hours worked, there's $2 spent, right? So remember you start at the origin. The next one is seven hours, $6, and then nine hours and seven, oops, Oh, I didn't mean to. Okay. It's really just this one. I want to. Okay. So $9, seven. Uh, sorry, nine hours, seven dollars. And then 10 hours and nine dollars, 12 hours and 14, and then 13 hours and 11 dollars, okay? So you just grab that pencil and click, and there you have it, okay? So this is a scatter plot. And notice in this case, the dots resemble a linear pattern, but they don't lie exactly along a line. But it does make sense that as the number of hours you work increases, the amount you could spend on entertainment, you know, just feels more likely that that would also increase. And so we have this close to linear pattern. Uh, that's the same scenario. Let's see, the table below shows time spent watching TV and the time spent doing homework. So I'm going to pull up the Alex explanation here. And we can just see. So again, they nicely color coded the X stuff, time spent watching TV in blue and on the Y axis, the time spent doing homework in red, y-axis. Again, each row you could think of as an ordered pair. And then you would plot that ordered pair on the graph as a point, right? So for instance, 313, there's three, there's 13, right? And so here they have all of them. And again, I'm just kind of pointing out this linear pattern near linear pattern. And in this case, if I drew a line through there, it would have a negative slope, right? 
Okay, so that's constructing a scatter plot. And then here they're giving you bivariate data. So that means data for two variables, right? Bivariate. For quantitative variables x and y given in the table, and the data are plotted for you already here in the scatter plot shown next to the table. And they're asking you to sketch an approximation of what's called a least squares regression line. So I'm going to pull up the explanation here in Alex. The least squares regression line for a set of bivariate data is a straight line that may be said to best fit the data. And indeed, oftentimes it's called the line of best fit or the best fit line. Um, that is, it may be said to follow the general trend of the data as well as any straight line. There is a specific formula that uniquely determines that line. And if you click in here in Alex, it gives you this formula. We're not going to be using this formula, but it does give that for you. And also in our lecture notes, I believe it's in 11.3. Okay. So for the purpose of sketching the line, though, it usually suffices to think of the least squares regression line as a line to which the data points lie as close as possible. Okay, so basically, this is just an approximation. You're going to grab the line tool in Alex and try to get the line to fit the data as best as you can. Okay. So here's another problem. We have the data here in the table. It's already graphed for you. You're going to grab the line tool. Let me just say this is an approximation. So, you know, you just want to do your best to get the line through that data. Okay. Um, I've been known to be marked incorrect before. Um, sometimes I think they could just increase the tolerance a little bit. But again, you want to try. to just get the line as best as possible. I even feel like maybe maybe that's better. You know, I kind of look too that like there are some points above and some below and they're about even. We um, equidistant. Okay. So that's placing that best fit line. All right, the scatter plot below here shows the number of hours worked and the money spent on entertainment by each of 21 students. And now also shown is the line of best fit for the data. And now you're asked questions about this scenario. And so the idea is this is what we do in real life with linear regression. We collect data, we graph it, and then if we notice there's a linear pattern, we can calculate a, a linear regression line and then, or um, a line of best fit. And then we can use that line to make predictions. Okay, so here it says for these 21 students, as the number of hours increases, the amount of money spent also tends to, in this case, increase. And for these 21 students, we would say that is a positive correlation because this line of best fit has a positive slope. Okay, so as the X variable increases, the Y variable also increases, then that gives us a positive correlation. Now, using the line of best fit, we would predict that a student working 12 hours 
would spend approximately how much? Okay, so here's the 12 hours. So we're gonna go up and we're gonna use, I went up a bit too far, right? We're gonna use this actual line. So even though there is an actual observed data point at 1220, we are going to use the line of best fit to make the prediction. And so it's close to 30. The closest answer they have here is the $29, okay? So I'm gonna pull up the Alex explanation. Let me do it on the next one. All right, here scatter plot shows time spent watching TV and the time spent doing homework. And so in this one, as the time spent watching TV increases, the time spent doing homework decreases. Okay. And so in that case, we get a negative correlation. Um, so I'm going to click on this more here. Notice that the points on the scatter plot tend to form a band that goes from the upper left to the lower right. And this indicates that when X increases, Y tends to decrease. And so also for these 21 students, those who watched TV less than average. So if this is the average amount of time watching TV with the dotted line. And this is the average amount of time spent on homework with that dotted line, right? Those who watched less TV than average generally spent more time than average doing homework, okay? And so that's another way to think of this correlation. Also, if the line of best fit has a positive slope, then there's a positive correlation. If the line of best fit has a negative slope, then there's a negative correlation. And then again, we, for part C, actually use that line of best fit to make a prediction. So a student watching 12 hours of TV here we do about 17.1 hours of homework, okay? And so they give you a caution not to use the observed data of, in this case, 20, right? When X is 12, there's an observed data point of 20. That's an observed value, but we use the line to make the prediction of a future value. Okay, so that's really the power of this whole idea of regression. Let's see if there's another scenario. I think that might be it. We just don't know. Oh, okay. The scatter plot shows the weight and fuel efficiency for each of 24 vehicles and also the line of best fit. So you can see the heavier a car is as the weight goes up, the fuel efficiency goes down. And that makes sense, right? If you have a really heavy car, it's going to require more fuel to move it. So for these 24 vehicles, as weight increases, fuel efficiency tends to decrease. And so there is a negative correlation, right? That line of best fit has a negative slope because it goes down to the right. Using the line of best fit, we would predict that a vehicle weighing 3,000 pounds would have a fuel efficiency of approximately 30 miles per gallon. Right. 3,000 pounds. Come up here. And we get about 30 miles per gallon. Okay. So hopefully this is all pretty straightforward. Um, now also in 
we talk about the, what's called the sample correlation coefficient, which is denoted by the letter R. And this is a numerical measure of the strength and direction of the sample linear relationship between two variables. So it's basically telling you how linear the data are and in which direction. Does it have a positive slope or a negative slope? The value of R is always a number between negative one and one, including the negative one and one. If R is positive, then the sample data indicate a positive linear relationship. And if R is negative, then there's a negative relationship. The closer that R is to those extreme values, the one or negative one, the more linear the data are. And if the sample data points fall on a straight line with a, you know, a perfectly straight line with a positive slope, then R is one. It's a perfect positive linear relationship. It doesn't mean the slope is one. It means that the data are perfectly linear. It could be just slightly linear. It could be super steep, but it's positive slope and it's perfectly linear. If the sample data fall on a straight line with a negative slope, then you get that R equals negative one. And again, it could be super steep, it could be not very steep, but still with a negative slope and perfectly along a line. Okay, so this is again, how linear is it? And does it have a positive or a negative slope? And so this chart gives you um, some examples here with different correlation coefficients. Okay, so this is a data set with a sample correlation coefficient of negative one. And notice all of these data lie along a perfect line and it's got a negative slope. Okay, this, we can see these data are following a linear trend and that trend has a negative slope correlation coefficient of negative 0.75. This is not quite as linear as this data. Right? It's a little bit more spread out. Um, sample correlation coefficient of negative 0.5. This one, negative 0.25. You can still kind of make out the line and that it's going down. right? Definitely as compared to say this one with the positive sample correlation coefficient of positive 0.25 where that slopes up and this is set of data slopes downward. This uh, sample of data has no linear trend whatsoever. So the sample correlation coefficient is zero, R is zero. And then here you have more of a positive linear trend, right? Positive, much more linear, and here perfectly along a line, okay? And Caroline, I apologize. I just saw your message there. I take it that was for the last problem. <laughs> A little slow. It's because these this window was blocking that. But hopefully, let me know if you want to go back and, you know, if you have any questions or anything. Okay, so this problem, it gives you four bivariate data sets and their scatter plots. So here's data set X, Y, U, V, W, T, and M, N, and their corresponding scatter plots. And notice they're all shown with the same scale. Right? Each set data set is made up of sample values drawn from a population. Oh, excuse me. And then you're asked questions, which data set has an apparent positive, but not perfect linear relationship between its variables? And so we see data set UV, right? It has that positive slope. This is along a perfect line, but this is still 
you know, a linear relationship, just not perfect. So which data set was that UV? Which data set indicates the strongest negative linear relationship? Okay, so WT has a negative slope. And in which data set is there evidence of a strong nonlinear relationship? So this means that a relationship exists strongly, but it's not a linear one. And look, these first three here all have a linear relationship. This one doesn't appear to have any kind of relationship. So none of these have a strong nonlinear relationship. And which data set indicates a perfect positive linear relationship? And that's this first one, X, Y. Okay. All right, so here's an example of a data set with a pretty strong nonlinear relationship. This looks like a parabola rather than a line, right? So again, we get four bivariate sets and their corresponding scatter plots. So which data set indicates a perfect negative linear relationship? And that's this data set MN. Which data set has an apparent positive but not perfect linear relationship? Well, both of these have negative relationships. This is apparently linear and positive. So UV. Which data set is there evidence of a strong nonlinear relationship? And that would be this first one, X, Y. Which data set indicates the strongest positive linear relationship between its two variables? The strongest positive linear relationship. And that would have to be UV. the only one with a positive linear relationship. Okay. Okay, so this is a similar type of question. You're given um, scatter plots for four data sets. And then you're asked these questions. Which data set appears to show no relationship between its two variables? And so figure one has a negative linear. This one has a positive linear. And this one has a, a strong nonlinear relationship. But figure two really doesn't appear to have any kind of relationship. Which data set appears to show a negative linear relationship? That would be figure one. A positive linear relationship, that would be figure three. And a nonlinear relationship, that would be figure four. All right, so in this topic, Alex wants us to identify the difference between correlation and causation. And so they give you three different scenarios and then you're asked to answer these questions about whether or not there's correlation or causation. And so let me just pull up two quantities have a correlation if they tend to vary together. Okay, so suppose there are more bees in a yard when there are more flowers, right? So if you had flowers down here, right, the number of flowers, and here you had the number of bees. 
And it says, if there are more bees when there are more flowers, right? You're gonna have some kind of a positive correlation. And then suppose less coffee is consumed when the temperature is higher. So if this is temperature, and this is the amount of coffee, in like in ounces maybe in temperature and degrees, right? As the temperature is hotter, less coffee is consumed. And so this has a negative correlation. Um, so as it says here, right? There was a negative correlation with the coffee and the temperature and a positive correlation between um, the number of bees and the number of flowers. Okay. A huge, huge uh, takeaway is that correlation does not imply causation. So just because two variables are correlated does not mean that one caused the other. Okay. Um, in order to show causation, we really need um, very controlled experiments. So just because there's a correlation, there may or may not be causation. Uh, so let's see, here's an example. An English teacher gave his students a spelling test based on a numbered list of words. He found that when a word appeared later in the list, fewer students tended to spell it correctly. So the position of a word and the number of students who spelled it correctly tended to vary together. So there was a correlation. But later on, the teacher found that words that appeared later in the list were longer. So a controlled study showed that a word being longer was the direct reason fewer students spelled it correctly. Um, a word being longer directly caused fewer students to spell it correctly. This means that there was causation between word length and the number of, of students who spelled it correctly. There was not causation between the position of a word and the number of students who spelled it correctly. And so oftentimes when, you know, we do studies or we read about studies, we can see a correlation and we want to, you know, make more out of it. We want to say that one thing caused the other. It's, um, it's a, a bit much to show that. Okay, so here, the car dealership conducted a study and it showed that a younger customer tended to purchase a lower priced car. So there is a correlation, right? We can't say the first one. There is a correlation between age and purchase price. There may or may not be causation. So in all of these scenarios, these are gonna be the three you know, choices. There either is no correlation or there is, and there may or may not be causation. We, we don't have enough evidence to say probably causation. Okay. Um, and so the next one, a doctor's office found a lower outside temperature did not indicate a change in the number of appointments made. Okay. So just because it was cold out, it didn't affect the number of appointments made, so there was no correlation. And here, a piano instructor examined student progress. She noticed that when students spend less time playing video games, their memorization didn't tend to change. So there's no correlation, right? One thing didn't affect the other. There was no correlation. All right, so that one. 
All right, so now interpreting the slope of a least squares regression line. So here, you're given data, you're given the scatter plot, you're given the regression line, the least squares regression line of the best fit line, and the equation of the best fit line. Okay, this particular scenario in this example, the well-known psychologist, Dr. Elbod, has established what he's called this generalized anxiety scale, or GAS. The GAS, which is a scale from zero to 10, measures the general anxiety of an individual with higher scores corresponding to more anxiety. Dr. Elbaugh's assessment of anxiety is based on a variety of measurements, both physiological and psychological. The bivariate data give the GAS score and the number of hours of sleep last night for each of 15 adults in the study, and there's the uh, best fit line, et cetera. And so you can see the more anxious someone is, the less sleep they got. All right, so let me uh, pull up the Alex explanations here. The problem has two quantitative variables. They're naturally paired. Scatter plots paired. We'd like to examine the relationship. Um, from the given scatter plot, it appears that there is a tendency for the y values to decrease as the x values increase. The simplest way of expressing this tendency is by a straight line with the negative slope. If located appropriately, would give a fair summary. So we use that simple linear regression. And this explains more about the simple linear regression model or a first order linear model, if you're interested in that. Um, the regression equation is useful not only for predicting values of y from values of x, but also for giving an idea of how values of one variable change as values of the other variable change. So for instance, the regression equation directly gives the estimated change in y from a one unit increase in x. This estimated change is called the estimated marginal change in y. And it turns out that the estimated marginal change in y equals the value of the slope in the regression line. Okay, so this is the big takeaway here, that the estimated marginal change in y is the value of the slope, okay? Um, They walk through a couple of examples here in Alex. So consider this regression equation in this problem. The slope of the line is negative 0.28. If the x value increases one unit, say for example, from 1.3 to 2.3, then the predicted value of y decreases from just over eight hours of sleep to you know about less than 7.8 hours of sleep. And the change in those number of hours equals the slope, okay? In fact, it's always the case that the slope is equal to the predicted change in y. I mean, that's really this whole idea of slope, right? When you think about how we graphed, like if the slope was negative two, we went down two, right, one. So for every one you increase, you go down two. So here it says to consider this regression line with B0 plus a slope of B1, an increase in X from the value C to C plus one. So this is abstract as opposed to here we use real numbers. So this is showing that it works for any value. It's not just like 1.3 and not just for this particular regression line. Right, so from C to C plus one, we've increased that X value by one. And then if you plug these in, right, the change in the slope, if you subtract equals B sub one, which is that slope. 
Okay. So again, the big takeaway here is that um, that estimated marginal change equals the slope. Okay. So um, for the first question, they say for the data, sleep times that are greater than the mean of the sleep times. So you can send the data, oops, not to Excel. We can send the data to the calculator for each one of these sleep time and the GAS score and get the averages. And then look at, let's see, maybe colors will help. Uh, sleep times that are greater than the mean of the sleep times. So this is the mean of the sleep times. And so, you know, these that are greater, are paired with GAS scores that are less than the mean, right? This is the mean GAS score. And so these are all less, you know, for the most part, except for these two, less than the mean GAS score, okay? And so, uh, this is also shown by the fact that the slope of the regression line is negative. And then for part B, right, they're asking for the estimated marginal change. According to the regression equation, for an increase of one in the GAS score, there is a corresponding decrease of how many hours. So the slope was negative 0.28. So it's a predicted decrease of 0.28 hours of sleep time. Right. Notice we don't put negative in there because decrease refers to the negative part of the slope. Okay. So let's look at another one. All right. An advertising firm wishes to demonstrate to its clients the effectiveness of the advertising campaigns it's conducted. The following bivariate data on 12 recent campaigns, including the cost of each campaign and the resulting percentage increase in sales were presented by the firm. And from that data, we can compute the least squares regression line. And here is the scatter plot with that best fit line plotted on there. Okay, so we can see the more money that you spend on a campaign, I mean, you would hope to increase your sales, right? So for these data's, uh, data, values for campaign cost that are less than the mean for the campaign cost. So let's see. Values for campaign cost that are less than the mean of the campaign cost. So let's get the mean of the campaign cost. Select the data for the campaign cost, send it to the calculator, while it's highlighted, click on the sample mean button. Okay, so the mean is 2.595. So that's about here. And I don't have a dotted line, but I can do a straight line. Okay. And so it says less than the mean. <laughs> so that's all this way. Paired with values for percentage increase in sales that are greater than or less than the mean. And I have to say this one, I mean, it looks, uh, you know, like about equal really on this one. 
2.595. But so we can send the data to the calculator. So for the increase, while it's highlighted, we can take that sample mean. Let's try it again. Increase in sales, sample mean, 6.632, give or take. Okay. So that's 6.7, so about right here. Okay. I'll put in one. Okay, so for these data that are less than the mean campaign cost, right, most of these are also less than the mean for the increase in sales. Okay. And then according to the regression line for an increase of $1 million in the advertising Ooh. campaign cost, because that's you know the cost in millions of dollars. Okay. So Josh, I'm gonna I, mute you. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, so we want to look at that regression line, and it's just going to be the 0.17, okay? There's a corresponding increase in 0.17 percent in sales, okay? All right, so this is interpreting that slope of the least squares regression line. And then, okay, um, Similar situation here. And then we're being asked some questions. So here, can movie rental revenue be predicted, right, based on theater revenue? So a movie comes out, it's in the theater, it makes a certain amount of money, revenue in millions of dollars. And then can that be used to predict how much money it's going to make on the rental market? So a movie stu studio wishes to determine that relationship from rental of comedies on streaming services and the revenue generated from the theatrical release. And the studio has the following bivariate data for films over the past five years. And this is that um, least squares regression line. So based on the studio's data and the regression line, what was the observed rental revenue when the theater revenue was $21.9 million? Okay, so observed, that's going to be one of these actual, you know, data points. The observed rental revenue when the theater revenue was 21.9. So that's 5.6 million dollars okay and then from the regression equation what's the predicted rental revenue when the theater revenue is 21.9 million so now you're going to use this line and plug in 21.9 right this was the observed value here but the predicted one
we put in the 21.9 and we get 6.885 millions of dollars. Okay. Uh, round to one or more decimals. So I'll round it up to 6.9. All right. So let's see if there's another scenario here. The Cadet is a popular model of SUV known for its relatively high resale value. We've got, you know, mileage and the used selling price from a sample of 16 of these cars, each bought new two years ago and each sold used, used within the past month. Okay. So here you have the mileage and the used selling price. And as you would think, right, the more mileage a car has, the less value. And so again, here they're asking what's the observed selling price and what's the predicted selling price? So for the observed, and I was hoping they would kind of give you a nice little picture, but there's 20.9 and 30.7 thousand dollars is the observed. And then, you know, for the next one, you could use that least squares regression line to predict if you had another car with that, you know, number of miles, you could, could predict you would get $31.7 thousand dollars or $31,700, right? Okay. And I think some of these do ask different questions, maybe. Maybe not, or maybe I'm just not finding it observed and predicted. Okay, but so that is it for not only chapter 11, but for all the material in this course. So I'm going to stop right here.